Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dave, and I am the program lead this year for uh, Calgary Comic Expo. And I am so glad to see all of you here. We come together every year to put together a great show, and I think this year we've got a stellar kind of show. But it's not for us, it's for you. I want to take a moment and give some ha a hand to these, uh, the people running around in red shirts. They are our volunteers. And this is... <laughs> This event could not happen without their input and all the hours that go on before the show ever starts. I want you to take a day, day and enjoy it. Just uh, get into this uh, whole scene that we've got running here and uh, enjoy it. Because, you know, this might be the last day. Tomorrow might be the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. We're not supposed to talk. Oh, we're not supposed to talk about it. Sorry. I'm not supposed to talk about zombie apocalypse. Great. We're going to get started here in just a few minutes. Thank you so much for being here. Be a great audience. If you have any questions, come and find me, and I will uh, send you to somebody who probably knows the answer. <laughs> All right, everybody, the panel's going to begin shortly. Please, just as a quick reminder, no flash photography or recording. Um, you can just take regular pictures. Um, and if you do have a question, uh, we have two mics set up in the aisles here on either side here. Hello, Calgary Expo. How are we all doing on Sunday morning? Are we doing okay? Anybody watch Doctor Who last night? 
Who didn't? Okay, here's what happened. It's awesome. Spoiler, there was a TARDIS involved. Uh, this is the 50th anniversary uh, of Doctor Who, of course, as you all know. Uh, we're lucky enough to have with us today Doctor Who himself, the seventh Doctor, and as well, Radagast the Brown from The Hobbit, ladies and gentlemen, Sylvester McCoy. It is on, there we go. And that's what happened, you see. <laughs> anyway, ah, wow, lovely to see you all. How lovely of you all to come. Um, here we are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you want to... Have uh, a seat. Have a seat. Where will I take it? Right here. All right. Are we uh, sitting... This looks weird. Yeah. I think you should be there and I should be there. I heard it too. I'm in the wrong place, sorry. That's a canned applause. <laughs> They made, a, they, they made a bigger roar than you did. I'm off. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you roar louder than them? <laughs> wow, wow, that's brilliant. Well done. Give yourself a bigger round of applause. Well done. <laughs> the throat sweets you can get outside in the chemists. <laughs> Hello. How are you doing? I'm fine, yeah. Yeah? It's good to be here. How have you enjoyed Calgary? Fine, yeah. I arrived from Australia on very late, midnight, almost into Tuesday morning in Calgary. Got up on Tuesday, went downtown, walked around. I find it fascinating because um, uh, it was lunchtime and I was in the walking street. Stephen Street, is it? Or something like that. Anyway, I was down there and it was all the people and then we, I went to lunch. I had lunch and when I came out, it was, everyone had vanished. I thought, where's everybody gone? And I, because I, I was wandering around, I couldn't find anybody. Well, there were some people, kind of a load of drunks, uh, you know, junkies, <laughs> uh, junkies and people playing b guitar very badly. Yeah. And I thought, what's happened? And then of course, I'm not used to these cities in the kind of Midwest and the North and the cold country where you actually don't walk outside, you walk up in walkways. <laughs> and I suddenly looked up and saw, my God, there's people. <laughs> that's where they live, that's where they... So I kind of went up there and I wandered around, you know, kind of walked around and that was Calgary for me. Mm -hmm. Well, you haven't been here in like the middle of January when it's yeah. minus 20 and that's the only way people can survive. Oh, no, no, I realize, I realize that. No, yeah. I understand totally why. And also, I mean, I've been to Minneapolis and I found the same thing. I arrived there and thought this was a dead city. The aliens had come and taken everyone away <laughs> until I looked up and realized they hadn't. But um, I also, in the, in the summer, it gets very warm down there, doesn't it? And they need them for the summer as well, because the, the extremes of weather. But you have very mild summers. Sounds nice, 20 odd degrees, is it? Something average? It can get nice. Yeah, it can Ish. get nice. Well, there's one, one day, I believe, they have a national holiday when that one day when it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were lucky in, in shooting outside when you were in Doctor Who because you had a huge heat wave at least twice when you're shooting Survival and, and Greatest Show in the Galaxy. Yes, that's true. It was a miracle, really. Um, the, uh, it's in the history books. It would, you know, at least for two weeks, it was over 100 degrees. And we were in, uh, shooting in the desert of Dorset. De Dorset doesn't really have a desert, but it's got a great sand pit where we used to go, and it's all like desert-like, so the... Greatest show in the galaxy we did there, as you said, and survival. And it was very, very hot. It was so hot that, um, of course, the BBC didn't give us any shading. And there was no shading. And I remember quite clearly this poor girl, well, well, there was lots of girls dressed up in fun fur, you know, as the cat people. And they, they were going <laughs> around the place, but they had no, no, uh, they were, well, they were melting. They were just dying of the heat. So what happened was one of them completely freaked out and she ripped off her costume. She couldn't stand it anymore. And she was last seen disappearing over a sand dune into... <laughs> the only thing she forgot that she was only wearing a thong. <laughs> it's very memorable, really. You stared at that one for a while. <laughs> well, come back and then go away again. And then, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. How'd you become Doctor Who all the way back? That's almost 25 years ago now that you were cast in Doctor Who. Yeah. I, well, I did do the 25th anniversary one, Silver Nemesis. You did. So that was 25 years ago. So I, mean, I think maybe I was cast 26 years ago. Maybe. That's right. I'm not 100% sure. Um, yeah. No, it's great. Amazing. I mean, utterly amazing. When it was killed off, you know, by those nasty... Yes, can I help you? What are you going? Sit. You're late. No, no, she's taking pictures. Benedictus nominum dominum. Yes, you are. <laughs> Say three Hail Marys and don't let it happen again. Uh, yeah, uh, w when those guys killed it off, um, I, I knew they were wrong because uh, the fan base was so in love with Doctor Who in Britain. And, I, and uh, Sophie and I kind of carried on making things, uh, you know, kind of pirated versions of Doctor Who in people's toilets and uh, get anywhere we could do it. <laughs> And then gradually it all came back again. And Big Finish grew out of that. I don't know if you know about Big Finish, but it's the... Uh, yeah, mm, they, I mean, it's because of them and because of the fans, really, principally because of Doctor Who fans, that Doctor Who came back. But we kept it going. We actually, you know, and I, I was determined, Sophie and I were determined, we wouldn't let it die if we could possibly help it. And we, you know, we didn't. And we're very proud of the fact it has come back. And... Um, that uh, you know, more new people and young children are getting to know Doctor Who again, and my Doctor as well. Well, I think technically, if you look at it in a nerdly statistical way, you are the longest running Doctor ever, because you went from I 87. Know, I, and at, then, at my age, I'm no longer running. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, the, I'm the longest limping Doctor, I think. <laughs> Because you, you, were you weren't even doing anything in Doctor Who, but you were the face of Doctor Who until you handed the keys over to Paul McGann yeah, in 96. Yeah, ugly little man. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, do you know they've got photographs of me with Paul McGann, right? Yeah. Have you seen them? Some of you might have seen them. He's standing on a box. <laughs> you know, they've got me handing the key over to him. And he's actually standing on a box. And then they, when you look at the photograph, you realize that then they bent the photograph that way to make him look even taller. <laughs> he's a dwarf. <laughs> Same height as me. No, he's a bit taller than me. That's about it. Really. He is tiny. I remember yeah. standing next to him thinking, that cannot be, that must be his son. But his son's taller than him, I think, now. Yeah, yeah, sons usually are. Right. Mine are. <laughs> but anyone, anyone would be taller than me, but anyway. Uh -huh. You, of course, worked with Paul on the, uh, the, the TV movie, which was shot, of course, in Canada. Yeah. Uh, next pro one province over. What was that experience like? That was great fun, because um, I, uh, the BBC, a wonderful organization, but, you know, they don't spend a lot of money on anything, really. So, uh, you know, I'd change in a toilet and I'd come out, and, you know, and save the universe and then go back to the toilet and take my costume off and go home. Um, so that, that, that was the kind of thing I did. But well, coming over here, they gave me a big, big, big Pantechnican uh, to dress and change in. And it had, you know, it had a, a lounge with all sorts of lighting for every, every mood. And the kitchen, shower, the lot. I wanted to live in it. But um, it was, uh, so that was amazing. Also, what was really good was I didn't have the responsibility. And I could really quite relax. Because when you're playing the doctor, you do carry a responsibility to make sure that all the other actors are having a good time or it's working, you know, because it all comes back to you. So that was a really relaxing. Paul took over that kind of role. That was great. And, but, but it was also wonderful to work with Eric... Um, uh, Roberts. 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 Eric Roberts, yeah. It was interesting also working with American actors because British actors work in the theater a lot and therefore we're, we're, we're more um, used to sharing and being part of a group. We, we work, whereas if you're a film actor, you don't even necessarily ever have to act with another human being. You don't really have to. I mean, and also in America, American actors are brilliant because they, they're so used to doing film acting. The, the, the relationship is with the camera more than with the opposite actor, necessary, not necessary, but yeah, that's, that's... So anyway, when Eric arrived, it was really what, interesting because he's a wonderful film actor, watching him. But I did also re know that what you're supposed to do when you arrive and you're giving you this big Winnebago and all that, he, he came and he said, well, I don't like that carpet, so change the carpet. And I thought, wow, I didn't know that. I didn't know I had to change my carpet. I've been here two weeks and I didn't even notice the carpet, but anyway. But it, by then, it was too late to ask them to change it. So, you know, I was learning how to be an American actor. So, <laughs> Could you change this carpet, please? It's not my color. <laughs> I'm only joking. Not. So, 
So how big then was the Winnebago when you went well, to Well, honestly, New it was a Pantechnicon. Oh, I mean, it was as big as this. It was a big, and it, it wasn't a Winnebago. It was a big, big, big trailer, uh -huh. like a big Pantechnicon and, and a big lorry on the front. I mean, it, uh, it never moved, sadly, because I imagined, you know, driving off onto location. Right. But, you know, we never left Chinatown. Because <laughs> that's where I get shot. <laughs> oh. Did you have as big a one for uh, The Hobbit in New Zealand? Oh, yeah, pretty, not as big as, the, funnily enough, not as big as that one. But right. we all, uh, quite, you know, we all had um, uh, a caravan, really. Everyone had the same size caravan. There was no differential. Mm -hmm. And um, no one was allowed to change the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> New Zealand rules. How'd you, how'd you get the role of uh, Radagast the Brown? Radagast the Brown. Well, I was hoping you'd you do that. Um, well, what happened was that uh, many years ago, in the far distant past, in Middle England, they were doing three films called Lord of the Rings. And um, I was up for Bilbo Baggins. So all those years ago, I went up for Bilbo Baggins, amongst many other actors, and then it, they, they paired it right down to two, and I was one of the two. So it was between myself and Ian Holm. And I didn't know who the other actor was, but if, for six months, they kept saying to my agent, oh, please, tell him to keep these dates free, uh, because, you know, He's still in the picture, which is a big lie. But you know what I mean. Anyway, so uh, they, uh, that's what happened. And then eventually they made the decision and they went for uh, um, himself. It was, I, was, I was obviously disappointed, but I was also quite flattered to be in his company, to be thought you know, that I was nearly equal to him. It was very flattering at the time. Um, so that's when the beginning of my journey towards Radigas the Brown. Then years later, I happened to be asked to play the fool to Ian McKellen. You might have heard of him. Um, <laughs> Gandalf. Uh, I, I was asked to play the fool to his King Lear. And it's a very, I don't know if anyone knows King Lear, but it's a great double act. And it's a very interesting, uh, wonderful, wonderful play to do. So Ian and I toured the world with that for a year and a half. We, we worked together and then we made a film of it. We, in the, on the tour, we went to New Zealand. And then that, so I met the Peter and Fran and Philippa and their family. And so they got to know me. That was step two towards Radigas the Brown. And then uh, a few years later, uh, Guillermo del Toro was directing it and he didn't know who I was mm -hmm. so they asked me if I'd do a screen test so I did the screen test and they sent it to him and Guillermo del Toro said si <laughs> he's Spanish so anyway <laughs> that's what he said that meant I, I, so he liked what I did so uh, that's how I got Radicast the Brown and then when Peter Jackson took over for directing, he, yeah. was, he must have been in heaven, because he's a huge Doctor Who fan, right? Yeah, I, well, I didn't know. I had, well, I had a, I an inkling, because some when I, when, I, when I was doing uh, King Lear, we, we, Peter invited us, a few of us to his house, and his children were there, and they were hoping he might arrive wearing my costume. <laughs> but sadly, he didn't. He didn't arrive wearing it. And they were all a bit disappointed, his kids. They said, oh, Dad. So I knew he had the costume. But um, anyway, yeah, no, because he's got... Yeah, 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 Peter Jackson has got my Doctor Who costume. He's also got my Radigas the Brown costume. I'm hanging on to my own clothes like mad. He's not having those, I'm telling you. That was an interesting costume you had for, for R the B. Radigas the Brown. <laughs> Thank you. Because it had, I mean, it's funny when you took your hat off in the movie, and of course, you could obviously tell that birds have visited because it was screaming down your face is... Bird poo. Yeah. It's a pooey part, but someone had to do it. Uh, that, was a, that was a lot of prosthetic work, was it? Or because your well, nose yes. is bigger and there's all sorts of stuff going on there. Well, um, Weta, the Weta guys made the poo. And then the basic underground poo, you know, they made that and yeah. it stuck on. And then the, the uh, makeup lady added the kind of the delicacies of the poo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> As, as is there is, yes. That's what they won Oscars for, was the bird poo. Yeah, you know? delicacies yeah. of poo. Yeah. And now the, the Oscar for poo maker goes to... So there's a bunch that you did on location, but you also did a lot of green screen work, like the rabbits. 
uh, your giant rabbit sleigh that you were riding, which was, was fairly cool. How, how was that uh, an experience, sitting in front of a green screen riding green rabbits on well, a green I mean, sleigh? Well, I mean, I must tell you that the green screen is very difficult and technical, really, if you're not used to it. Luckily, I was in at the very beginning of green screen, although it was blue screen then. But, uh, and the reason why they changed it was because they discovered that a lot of costumes had blue in them. You know, like jeans and things like, you know, they're just blues are more regularly used. So that's why it became green screen. But when I did it, it was blue screen way, way back in the days of Vision On, which I believe was shown in certain parts of Canada, so people might know of it. Thank you, Mother. And so, um, <laughs> so I, I, I was used to it. But I, when I arrived for the first time, Ian, well, obviously we know each other by now because we worked together for such a long time. Ian welcomed me with open arms and said, thank God, thank God you're here. <laughs> I said, well, I said, oh, uh, he said, I've been doing this green screen. And he said, it's, he, well, the first time I did it, I cried. Because what happened was, he was, um, yeah, this is the studio, say, you know, it's huge, it's this big. The, 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 the dwarfs and um, the hobbit uh, Martin were all at one end, and Ian was all by himself at the other end. So if you've seen the film, and those early scenes where they're all together, this is how they did it. They had a thing they invented called a slave camera. I have music and there's no one there. <laughs> Anyway, they had this slave camera, and um, Ian was at one end, as I say, and they were at the other, and there were photographs of all the, the dwarfs and, uh, uh, and the hobbit, and when they spoke, he had a thing in his ear, he could hear it in his ear, and a light would go on, and he'd have to act to those pictures. And he said, he just sat there, and, he went, and when he said action, he went, <laughs> <laughs> I've been an actor for 70 years, <laughs> nearly, and, this is not acting. <laughs> and it wasn't, I mean, it really is, it is weird. Aha, you're right. <laughs> and so, I'm glad you got it in the end. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so he, he was, you know, it was just, it was, it was so pleased to see me because we could make eye contact. Yeah. I know, I, you know, I still had to look up, but I mean, at least he could see my eyes. And he, you know, we could do what we call, you know, acting rather than green screening. But there was one bit when, it, when I was on the sledge, and they, they, what they did was they had a green screen. All the floor was green, the walls were green, the people in it were green. There were two men who were shaking the sled because it was put on a big rubber tubing type thing, and then on top of that was green. And so they got the sled, and they were lying on the floor. It was like a, an art, you know, kind of thing, you know, these green guys. And they were shaking it, and I was on it. And at one point, they decided they wanted to get a low shot but the, underneath the green was matting, so they took the matting away to get really low, and then they put the green back, and then they forgot to put the matting back, and then that was when I flew off the sledge. <laughs> you would, I mean, yeah, I could have flown off before, and it wouldn't have been so bad, but I actually, I was, had to do a double take, which is, you know, was, and they wanted a really, I had to go, you know, uh, do that, <laughs> and <then>, more, <laughs> and so my hand actually threw, and I flew off, and I landed on the concrete, and my bum, ah, and my head was just hitting the concrete. My head was just hitting the concrete. I could feel my brain move in my head as, <laughs> in, in, in slow motion as these things always happen. Uh, but as luck would have it, one of the stuntmen dived like a rugby player and caught my, and caught my head <laughs> and saved me from being knocked out or something worse, who knows. I would maybe be standing here going, where am I? But anyway, that was green screen acting. <laughs> In a nutshell. I don't recommend it, uh, really. Well, uh, I bet you some of you probably have some questions. So uh, put your hand up, and uh, I think our, our, our uh, ex escort here, namely Sylvester McCoy, will come down and uh, ask you that question himself. Now, I want you all to behave. <laughs> Questions. Ah, you have a question. What was it like working with Anthony Ainley? Anthony Ainley, well, ah, he was a brilliant uh, master. The thing about Anthony was that he loved playing the master. And he wanted to do, that was the only job he ever wanted to do after he got it, was play the master. But um, I think it, it took over a bit because he became a bit like the master. 
we were doing uh, survival, and you know, he, he, was, he was my enemy in survival. And uh, we, we were out in the deserts of Dorset. It was so hot, and I was wearing that ridiculous question mark jumper. And um, they, they, there was contact lenses involved in all of this. Because what happened was, at the beginning of it, they said, well, you, you, you act as you are the characters. You go and see the, 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 uh, the ornithologist, whatever it's called, and get your eyes tested, and we'll give you contact lenses. But they said, you, the doctor, don't need them. Then we, on the day bef uh, as we were filming, they suddenly said, oh my God, you do need contact lenses. So what they did was they gave me someone else's contact lenses. <laughs> and, and also there was sand everywhere. And it was, so I always had, I mean, no acting required. Some people say that's the best piece of acting they saw me do. I would just, all they had to do was torture me with contact lenses. <laughs> and then Anthony Ailey was supposed to hit me with a femur, you know, a blown. He was a bit of a method actor, because I couldn't see. And of course he, he was actually hitting me. He wasn't even pulling the hits. He was just thumping me away. So, yeah, that's what it was like working with Anthony Inley. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering, with the Big Finish audios and also the novels that have been published featuring your doctor, is there anything where you've gone, gosh, I wish we got to do that on the telly? Um, yeah, yeah, there were sometimes. I mean, the audio ones are interesting because um, I, they, it's, I don't, you, you don't too often want to have said, I wish you could do that on telly. Because tell you, I love doing the audios because what happens is you get inside the doctor's head. You're right in there. You can get the thoughts of the doctor. Whereas if you're doing it on television, it's visual more than anything else. So you've got to, in sense, communicate those things visually. Whereas on audio, you can really, really, really get into it. So I've, I've, I enjoy doing them. I enjoy doing the ones where I was on my own singularly, as well as with you know various different companions. Um, uh, I mean, w what's been great about doing the audios is that we've, I've, we've started to do the things that I wanted to do when we were doing the telly. So I'm quite satisfied with the fact that that's gone on. And, you know, and also audio means that, you know, I still look 25. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm six feet tall and the sets don't shake. You know, so, <laughs> it's, you know, I like audio for that reason. Yes. Hi. Hello. Uh, what do you think is the silliest monster to ever be up? Never be on Doctor Who. The silliest monster. Oh, good. <laughs> well, uh, my pardon? <laughs> there have been some doozies. <laughs> That's a wonderful phrase. <laughs> what does it mean? Anyway, no. <laughs> What's the, ah, well, I, I, for me, in mine, um, you know, uh, the ones I did, I thought Dragonfire was a, a bit ridiculous, really. I mean, the, the, the guy that did it was a lovely, skinny little fella, and they put him in this rubber suit, and then they gave him this huge head, and, you know, he kind of just slowly died throughout the shoot because of the heat and everything. So um, that was, yeah, that, that, that was about the silliest one that I, uh, I worked with, but there were many silly other ones. What about you? What do you think was the silliest one? Candyman. 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 Ah, well, yes, a lot of people didn't like him. I, I was disappointed, really. I think what, the reason why he didn't work was the voice. Because everything else, the, the thing I really liked about Doctor Who was when uh, they used kind of comfortable creatures and then made them somewhat dangerous. Do you know what I mean? I thought that was really good. And the Candyman is, I don't know if you had him here, but he's quite a famous image for sweets in Britain. And uh, so there was kind of, our children love it. So to try and turn it into a monster seemed to me like a really good idea. But they got the voice wrong. I think if they got the voice right. So the next time you do it, why don't you switch it off uh, when he's talking and do a very nasty voice and then turn it back on again when someone else talks and see if it works. <laughs> That's my suggestion. What was your favorite experience of being on the set of Doctor Who? My favorite experience? Well, I had lots of them, really. There was one when we were doing the, the, the Daleks one, uh, Remembrance of the Daleks. I'm glad I remembered that. That was the only. Um, and it was the 60th anniversary of the Easter Rebellion in Ireland. The, uh, and the IRA were very active in the 80s, blowing up people and things in, our, in Britain. And that was the 60th anniversary. It was on a Monday. We were filming underneath the arches, underneath Waterloo Station in London. And um, there was a big battle of the Daleks going on. And the pyrotechnic boys had made this uh, under the arch, all this explosion. And the explosion went off. And it was 
the cars rattled, the alarms went off, windows were broken, and smoke everywhere. And it was on the radio. The, the IRA have blown up Waterloo Station. <laughs> Someone had forgotten to tell them it was the BBC and it was the actual. So anyway, I was standing this street here, and the, the smoke was coming out of the, the tunnel like that. And I looked down there, and there was an ambulance, and then there was a fire engine, and there was police cars, and all was screaming down. Nah, 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 nah. And then they screeched to a halt. And the ambulance driver, his jaw dropped to his chin because out of the smoke came three Daleks. <laughs> it was an astonishing sight. Of course, if you listen very carefully, the Daleks had Irish accents. <laughs> exterminate, ah, yeah, Jesus, no, exterminate, exterminate. <laughs> Anyone around here? Over here. Um, what was your favorite episode to film? My favorite episode to film? Oh, it's very difficult because I, I, you, we don't, to watch is interesting. You know, the favorite one to watch, I would say, um, uh, Curse of Fenwick, I like watching uh, the, the Dalek one. Um, to film, perhaps, the, what? Doctor and the Rani. Well, no, I didn't. But the thing is, when I took over, and it always happens to every doctor when they take over, there's a, there's a very vocal, small minority of Doctor Who fans who hate you. <laughs> but they're vocal. And, and I, when I took over, they hated me, this bunch. And I, and I know them, and, you know, and they've, they've apologized and all that kind of stuff. But they were very vocal, and, and I thought maybe it wasn't that good. And I hadn't watched it for years. And I watched, I watched it recently. And I, got, I rather enjoyed it. And also, I'm so distant from that doctor, that person that played him then. I mean, sometimes when I come onto the stage and they've got a, you know, a photograph or a film up of my Doctor Who, I come on and say, I apologize, Sylvester McCoy couldn't make it. He sent his father instead. <laughs> so, you know, I've got that distance from him. So I quite, I quite enjoyed it when I watched it. But... Um, uh, what was the other one? Oh yes, oh yes, the the the, uh, the other one I like because I just told you the story about uh, survival. You know, the girl taking off a costume and running away. <laughs> you know, that's one of my favourites as well for some reason. Well, speaking of explosions, what did you think of using Nitro Nine as plot device? Well, <laughs> the the thing, another thing was when I got the Doctor. I had a distant memory of Doctor Who. I hadn't seen it for years. I'd seen Patrick Troughton, John Pertwee, and, um, and Tom, first half of Tom. Then I became an actor, and we didn't have VCRs, no recording, and because you, you don't watch anything that you can't watch regularly, and they're episodic, and so that's why I lost complete touch with Doctor Who. I had a distant memory of it, and when they gave me the job, I looked at it, and I saw that he was doing violent things, and they gave me some videos of uh, quick, you know, uh, catch up to look and see the others. And I thought, I didn't, I thought the doctor was above violence. And so I, I, saw, I thought, the doctor coming from an alien planet, uh, he's much more intelligent and all that kind of stuff. Although why have they employed me to play such an intelligent role? I've no idea. But anyway, he, that he would not, he would, his brain would somehow overcome the need to use violence because violence is not a strength, it's a weakness. Um, so that was my philosophy. But at the same time, we are doing an adventure. You know, it's got to be blam, bang, boom, and thing. But at the same time, so I thought, well, I'll, my doctor will n try never to do violence. But you need someone to do it. And so Ace was there. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so the Nitro 9, she could blow people up. And that was always that, you know, that Nitro 9 you're not carrying. Quick, throw it now, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> And, but there was one in the, uh, the, yeah, the Daleks one where they gave me a, a bazooka, you know. They actually said, the doctor takes a bazooka. And I said, no, no, the doctor does not take a bazooka. Ace does. <laughs> so I kept to my philosophy of the doctor not being violent. But also I thought that's a good debate to have. People should think about violence and, you know. What, I mean, we've got enough superheroes wearing their underpants outside their trousers with their muscles and thumping each other. There should be one that doesn't actually have to do it violently. But that was my philosophy. And um, there we go. Ooh, back up over here. Let's see what this side of the world's like. Okay. Um, other than yourself, who's your favorite doctor? Do you think I'm my favorite doctor, do you? <laughs> Listen, every time I watched Doctor Who, when I came on, I used to hide behind the couch. 
Who's my favorite doctor? Well, I suppose they say you the do Where are you going? <laughs> come back here. Come back here. <laughs> Sit. <laughs> they, they, they say that your favorite doctor is the one you first watch, and that's true, I think, to a lot of people. <laughs> oh, thank you. And so my first was uh, Patrick Troughton. That's who I saw first. So, uh, oh, I just saw him. Did I just see someone dressed as Patrick Troughton, or is it just he's haunting me? Oh, no, you're kind of... Pa no, you're, t you're uh, William Hartnell-ish, aren't you? Yeah. Are you? Oh, really? <laughs> you're too tall. Anyway, um, <laughs> so I thought, yeah, he's, he's the guy. I think Patrick Troughton is my favourite doctor. How much say did you have in what your TARDIS looked like, especially in the movie, because it was quite different, and your actual costume during the show and movie? Well, the TARDIS, very little. I mean, I arrived in the, my BBC days of Doctor Who, and there was the TARDIS, the inner bit. I always fancied uh, steampunk, although it hadn't been invented then, I don't think. But I had fancied that kind of world. I mean, I remember I used to love the film when I was a child, 2,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and that kind of world and that kind of set. I love the idea of taking something very old-fashioned and pressing a button and, you know, a nuclear bomb goes off. Oh, you know what I mean. You know, that you can, something amazing happens, high technology. So I love that contrast. So when I got to do the film and I walked onto the set, I thought, oh, my God, that's my, that's it. That's my console. That's my inside of the TARDIS. So I was very pleased with that. Now, the costume. What happened was it was a sunny day in England. Is it, is it, no, it is. It's, uh, it's historically, they've noted it down. It was one day in England. It was sunny. Anyway, it's a bit like Calgary, really. And so um, I, I, I wore my hat as, as I did oh, then, like uh, the way the doctor's hat was. People didn't do that in those days, you know, but I did. Because I always knew that, um, that if you go to an interview, and this is, this is something you should write down and learn, you should wear something unusual. Because visually, if you, people remember visually quite strongly, most likely stronger than may, many other things that you might do in an interview, if you've got this visual thing, especially if you're an actor. So I went along with a hat like that on a sunny day. I arrive, I see John Nathan Turner, producer. He says, I love that hat. Oh, I'd love to have that hat in Doctor Who. And I said, well, if the hat's in Doctor Who, so am I. It's mine. <laughs> so that's how I got the role, you see. So then, then after, after that, uh, pardon? Exactly, yes. The hat is, the, yeah, if you don't like it, it was the hat that did it badly. Anyway, <laughs> so, so then, then um, the, the, the pullover arrived, uh, and I didn't really like the pullover. I thought the question marks were overstated. I always did, really, and I thought it would be much more subtle. And, but um, I think John Nathan Turner's granny knitted them. So uh, there was no way one could get rid of it because of John Nathan Turner's granny. So I had to wear it. The jacket, I wanted a jacket that was kind of slightly, well, like a Cambridge Dawn, also um, Chekhovian kind of jacket with big pockets because I knew that I was going to have to keep my script in the pocket to the last possible moment. And so I had big pockets for my script. And I also thought my doctor would be like a boy who would always have bits and pieces in his pocket and he'd take them out and, you know, somehow make something. And, and he did, and that part bits of him did that anyway. But if you notice, those of you who are really, you know, that keen, or that mad, really, um, if, you, if you look very carefully at some of the scenes, you'll see uh, the, the pocket on the right-hand side, if it's out a bit, that means it's morning, and that's the beginning of the day, and the day scenes are there. And then as the day progresses, this pocket gets bigger, <laughs> where the scenes that have been done go in, and this pocket goes down and becomes flat. And so you'll know when a scene was shot by the end of the day, this is flat. <laughs> and so that's why I wanted big pockets. And when, when, when Sophie Aldred arrived, she was brilliant. She used to know my lines and everything, which was great, because I'd say to Sophie, what do I say now, Sophie? And she'd know them. But after three years working with me, by the end of it, she was in my pocket trying to get the script as well. <laughs> she could not. Rem she caught the thing of not remembering lines. Hello, get out of the way, move, show. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. First and foremost, I want to say you are a phenomenal doctor. Thank you. <laughs> Second, <laughs> secondly, what was it like working with Nicholas Courtney? 
Nicholas, oh, what a wonderful man. It was great working with Nicholas because, yeah, the brigadier. When, when I watched Doctor Who all those years ago when I was talking about it, um, when, when Nicholas came, came on the scene uh, as the brigadier, you know, playing uh, the military intelligence, which is a contradiction in terms. Anyway, <laughs> he played that part beautifully because he did give the idea that he was a bit bumbling and not really that bright, but he had such charm and uh, it, warmth that came through the screen. And I used to love watching him. So when eventually I got a, a story and I heard that he was going to be in it, I was just over the moon with joy. And being Doctor Who, I could be over the moon quite easily, really. <laughs> so I get in my TARDIS and just go over the moon. So, I mean, it's, uh, I, I, it was really great. I, I, I was, and he was such a gent. He was so kind, such a nice, nice man, and brilliant at his part. Hello. Hello. Uh, it's nice to meet you. Um, my question is, because um, you've met the other doctors, do you ever discuss like your own interpretation with them, and do they ever like? Do, do you ever have like disagreements over how the doctor should be played? Um, yeah, I mean, so, you know, when I meet Tom Baker, he said, "Hello, little man. <laughs> I'm the doctor. <laughs> I'm the doctor. No, you're not." <laughs> There's a bit of that goes on. Um, no, there was only once, I mean, that thing I said earlier about violence. I remember uh, with Peter who was there and maybe Colin somewhere. And I mentioned the fact that so I believe the doctor should not be doing violent things. And, and they disagreed. So there was a disagreement there. But we didn't take it any further because, you know, yeah, yeah. And I quite like to have a discussion with them, you know, in, about it. But that, that was about all, really. We got on really well. We just did a tour of Australia. The four of us, the, there are five living 20th century doctors. Well, Tom is, doesn't travel much anymore. So the four of us did this 50th anniversary tour of Australia and New Zealand, which I've just come from. And, and we had a great time together. We've become such friends over the years because we share something. You know, it's a bit like the other day I saw the American president, um, Bush. Uh, he was getting uh, opening a, a library and all the other presidents were there. And I was watching it and, you know, they all disagree with each other. But because they share something, they also share that kind of. And there's a kind of a bond in a way, even though they were politically hated each other. Most likely hated each other while they were doing it. So it's a bit like that with Doctor Who. You know, we're all kind of like each other because we share the same thing. Hello. Um, who is your favorite companion? You. <laughs> My favorite companion? Ah, well, that's difficult, really. I had two companions, I suppose. I've got now other ones on, on, on the audio ones. Um, it's very difficult to answer that, because Bonnie Langford and I worked together. We did a musical in the West End for a year. I used to marry her every night and twice on Saturdays. So, we, you know, we were uh, great friends. So when I arrived in Doctor Who, it wasn't as scary because she was there and that was lovely to work with her. So, and she helped me kind of relax into the role because I had to work with Kate O'Mara, my first, you know, the Rani. And at that time, Kate O'Mara was queen of the soaps internationally. I mean, she was in dysentery, wasn't she? No, no, I mean, dis <laughs> Dynasty. No, no, that's the wrong one. What's it called? Um, Dynasty. Yeah. Anyway, she was one of the. She was in that. And she was the, one of the. And so I was a bit nervous working with her. I was also doubly nervous when I had to play the spoons on her front. <laughs> I mean, and, and those spoons bounce. I can tell you. <laughs> one more. One more question, Sylph. But anyway, um, Sophie, I haven't quite finished this one. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Come back in a year. Anyway, it's Sophie. Um, See, she, oh gosh. Anyway, Sophie came along, um, and we are still firm, firm friends. So uh, I think I love, I love both um, Bonnie and Sophie. I love them very much, really. I, I saw Bonnie recently. She was in a musical in the West End, and I went along to do it, see her, and then she asked me if I'd do a little guest spot in it, and I did. I came on and walked off again. And, <laughs> and that's how she wanted me to do that in Doctor Who. No, that's a lie. Um, so, my grandfather first started watching Doctor Who when it first came out. Your grandfather? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no! And um, he used to tell me for years when he first saw it, he thought this was going to go nowhere because it was terrible in his mind. Um, when you... Uh, would you yes. <laughs> when you first saw it, did you think the same thing? Like, this is 
probably not going to go anywhere? Or you, did you think it would get this big? Well, no. I mean, it's very interesting. When they first did it, they only expected to run it for six weeks. And it was supposed to be um, you know, a science program more for children, make it more interesting, give, put a story around it. But it was, in a sense, slightly educational, talking about science, because at that time in Britain, they were talking about the, the white heat of technology, and uh, they wanted to you know, catch up with the rest of the world. So that's why it was only six weeks. But then it did catch on, and it became hugely popular, as you know, in Britain. And whenever the, the Daleks arrived, then that made it even more popular. And when the Dalek stories were on, the streets of Britain were empty. I mean, because there were only two channels in those days. Or maybe even one, I can't remember, 63. But anyway, there was, so everybody, the whole of Britain, were watching Doctor Who. It's astonishing, really, to think how the power of it all. And then, then uh, poor... Um, um, uh, What's his name? Uh, yeah, William. Yeah, well, poor William Hartnell got ill. And they suddenly realized, but wait a minute, he can't get ill. This is such a good show. And then um, the, the uh, producer, genius that she was, Verity Lambert, came up with the idea, well, he's an alien. Come down, take on a human form. Why can't he change it and become someone else? And so began the long journey of 50 years. But I never thought 50 years. I, when I did it, I just thought, it, I never even thought of the future, which is silly being a time lord, but um, <laughs> I just thought of the carrying on, if you know what I mean. I never thought what would happen next, beyond, next year. I just, all I knew, knew was, let's keep it going until it comes back. And I, but 50 years, it's astonishing, isn't it? Yeah, well, anyway, I'm amazed. Oh. <laughs> And you'd do it for 50 more, wouldn't you? I sure would. <laughs> yeah, no. It's gonna... Anyway, I must say, thank you very much for coming along. It's been great chatting with you and uh, meeting you and seeing you and touching you and... Uh. Bye. Uh. <laughs> Sylvester McCoy! Do you want to read it? Oh. Well, I got it. I think, I think it's only right that the last words go to Sylvester himself. Sorry, yes. Um, this is, these are the last words of doc, my Doctor Who on television. Someone gave me this beautiful box so, with lots of sayings in it, like, I'm not the professor, I'm the doctor. Absence makes the nose grow longer, and various things like that I used to say. But these, these are the words which were, there are worlds out there where the sky is burning, with the seas asleep and the rivers dream. People made of smoke and cities made of song. Somewhere there's danger, somewhere there's injustice, and somewhere else the tea is getting cold. <laughs> Come on, Ace, we've got work to do. Big hand for Sylvester McCoy, everybody. Thank you.